Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back with another Bible study. Today we are going to be back into the book of Yeshua, but if you are new here, if this is your first time, you might want to start at the beginning. This is not the place to jump in unaware of what is going on. I have an unconventional belief, and I hold an unconventional Bible study. But for everybody else, we are going to dive in to Joshua 10, because we left off in Joshua 9. Today, the day the sun stands still. <clears throat> Today is definitely going to be one of those days. Today we are going to be wandering into both speculation and conspiracy land. We will be doing a lot of geography, so we'll be going back and forth between Google Earth. We're going to be dealing with the second half of the conquest of the land of Israel. Joshua 10. Now, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that all the people of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were living near them. So Adonai Zedek and his people were greatly alarmed, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and its men were mighty. That's an interesting tidbit to add into our already knowledge. Let's go and look at where we are and what we're talking about right now. Let, yesterday, we talked about Jericho and the walls falling. We talked about the conquest of Ai and the fact that they went all the way up here and consecrated the mountains. Oh, we're not going to rehash the argument about whether Jericho is up here or not. I'm going with it is down here and that they just wreaked destruction and played with the timeline. But now we're talking about all uh, the people who made peace with them, right? So they conquered Ai and they and Bethel because Bethel came to the aid of Ai to help uh, to help repel these invaders because it is important to also note that these were invaders. These people, all of these little blue dots that you see right here represent somewhere where somebody was living peacefully. They were enforcing their own will upon the land and living as their customs dictated. How they had been born, raised, and lived and were all at relative peace with each other. Every one of these blue dots, with the possible exception of these two, and probably not, are places where destruction happened, where they went and laid waste not just to the fighting men, but to everything that breathes. It's important to remember that as we get into these battles and we discuss what is what is happening, because Gibeon right here is just south of I. It's not a long ways off at all, right? <clears throat> Reading the text, you would assume that it was at least a short distance, right? They're at least coming from down around Hebron, at least down around uh, in the Negev or somewhere like that. Not Absolutely not from over here, but at least a short journey. But it wasn't even a short journey, right? This is a day. This is a day away. If the pass is, like, I'm not sure, like, you can get a fairly good idea of the geography if you look at it this way and you get down deep then they pop up the mountains for you so you really can get in here on the roadways and look around and get a good feel for the topography but it doesn't really lay well to y'all so I don't do it a lot uh, let's get this reset to the north uh, I forgot where I was uh, I and Bethel uh, so Gibeon this is where some of the mighty men live now the mighty men are the Nephilim descendants. They are the great men of old. The mighty stories of old are told about these men, the descendants of the Nephilim and the Rephaim, and the, the various pre-races, we'll put it that way, who exist in the hill countries, in the upper reaches of the, the altitudes, because they don't do very well in the lowlands, except for some of them. Some of them live over here like there are a, a large larger population in this area oh but it's important to remember as we're going in 
what we're talking about. And so Gibeon, right here, south of where they have just killed everybody. Like, everybody in this area is dead now. Everybody who lived here previously has been slaughtered ruthless, ruthlessly. And so these people come up and deceive them and make a treaty. And they're like, oh, wait, we... And become their slaves. Willingly, right? They willingly become their slaves in order to save their lives. And that's where we're at now. And then Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Yeshua had captured it and devoted it and became greatly alarmed when Gibeon made peace because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities. It was larger than I and its men were mighty. So we're talking about here, right? Now, this is where they place Gibeon today. It's where it's historically considered to be located. All of these blue dots, I went through and tried to figure out where they are historically located. Some of them are a little shady, but we went with the best estimate in all the cases so that I don't have to keep doing this. But it's somewhere in this area, and as you can see, this is a good area for people to live. It may be that you can take this and drag this over this way a little bit, or you can drag it up this way a little bit. But this is where they put it. So uh, it's somewhere in this area, and it was a larger city than this, which they had just defeated and laid to waste. And they, they have some of these Nephilim there, some of these great-sized people. And the king of Jerusalem, let's talk about Jerusalem. Jerusalem is here. Uh, it lies surrounded by mountains, right? It's in a valley, pretty much. goes up the side of a mountain. So there's a, a valley right here, and there's mountains here, a mountain here. There's mountains over here. So <clears throat> it's not exactly in a valley, but it's in this area, this mountainous area. And if you're going to live in a mountainous area and there is an available valley, you're probably going to populate in the valley, right? Now... They worship in the high places, and they congregate in the high places, so I don't know exactly. But it's reasonable to assume right, that this is even pretty close to the layout, because it's talking about these are the royal cities, right? The royal cities. The fact that Gibeon was one of the royal cities. Jerusalem is one of the royal cities. Hebron is one of the royal cities. It's important to remember that as well because these royal cities were probably where the Anakim lived. Therefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent word to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up and help me. We will attack Gibeon because they have made a peace with Yeshua and the Israelites. So, let's look at who that is. That is Hebron, Jerusalem first, Hebron, then we had Jarmuth, we have Lachish, and Eglon. That's these places here. Right? Jerusalem, Hebron, Lachish, Eglon, and Jarmuth. This entire region says, wait, no, we are not going to put up with this. We are going to come together and go crush you for trying to assist these people so that we can then crush them before they destroy us. That's what's happening here. This isn't these people being aggressive and trying to just take over someone else's land. This is the strategic trying to save ourselves. This is a defensive maneuver. The aggressors in this is not the armies who attack. It's important to note that for me, right? The reason I do this is for me. We're going through this Bible study for me. And I share it with y'all because it is important that to God that I share it with y'all, right? He brought me to it so that I could share it with you. So the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces and advanced with all their armies, and they camped before Gibeon and made war against it. And then the men of Gibeon sent word to Yeshua at the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come quickly and save us. Help us, because all of the kings of the Amorites from the hill country have joined forces against us. So 
Yeshua and his whole army, including all the mighty men of valor, came from Gilgal. And the Lord said to Yeshua, Do not be afraid of them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not one of them shall stand against you. After marching all night from Gilgal, caught them by, Joshua caught them by surprise. And the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great slaughter at Gibeon, pursued them along the ascent to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel along the descent from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord cast down on them large hailstones from the sky, and more of them were killed by the hailstones than by the swords of the Israelites. And on that day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. Let's let's do this first. All right. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> do not be afraid, for I have delivered them into your hand, and not one of them shall stand before you. And after marching all night from Gilgal, Yeshua caught them by surprise, because that tends to be how he operates. All right. It is tends to be that when he has a victory, it is due to a surprise. All right. But they went. Instead of keeping the ground that they were in, right? Because they went from Gilgal, destroyed Jericho completely, laid it completely to waste. Came into Ai, laid it to waste. And instead of camping here and then reinforcing this with the forces that are still across the Jordan, or some of them came forward, and however it works, right? We had 40,000 people come across. Here's an interesting side note, right? I got I got pulled into some research and a deep dive in the, the the game I'm building and it led me into ancient ancient Greece and one of the generals of, of ancient Greece had control of one of the largest mercenary armies ever and his name was Xenophon he was a a student of Socrates and this largest army ever the one that almost took Babylon was 10,000 men that was about 600 years after this conquest sequence, but it, it's interesting to note. Like I'm not even disputing the numbers here because the the histories are recorded separately, right? Greece, although it is not all that far away, like the area we're talking about, where they were, was right over here, right? Where's Athens? Athens is right here, somewhere, it's right up in here, right there. There's Athens. So the area we're talking about is right here. But they had 10,000 men, and they almost took Babylon, which is over here, uh, uh, over up in here, along the Euphrates, right up in here, I think, uh, with 10,000 men. And so Israel crossed the Jordan, not with the 600,000 fighting men that we are told about in the census just prior to crossing the Jordan, but with 40,000 fighting men. So they narrowed the forces down, and that's they didn't need it. Like, that's a lot, right? It was just an interesting side note, and I'll be getting into that over. I, I got a, a pit cast coming up. And then the Lord throws them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them at a great slaughter at Gibeon, and pursued them along the ascent to Beth Haran. So let's look at Beth Haran, where we're talking about this is Gibeon, right? So they marched in one night from Gilgal. Let's go ahead and throw a tape measure on this. We go from here to Jericho. Well, we can even probably cut that out and say they come along the, cut, the hill country, but they had to cut through the mountains, right? We'll take this mountain pass that they've already conquered. We'll come into this area that they've already conquered, and then we'll come down into Gibeon, right? And what's our total on that? Where's the... Uh, I don't even know where to, to read the total at, y'all. I'm terrible at this. Oh, well. What was this? This was 23 miles, so that's 40, 60, 80 miles in a night. That's pretty impressive. Let's just do this. Let's do this. Uh, why is this up? Maybe that's my problem. That is it right there. Okay. All right, so let's just do this. We're going to do a bird's eye view. We're going to go from Gilgal with the measurement. <clears throat> just a bird's eye view is 18 miles. <clears throat> Goodness gracious. All right, so we... Cut across the hill country, that's 10 miles. Cut through this pass, that'll be 16 miles. So that's 26 miles. And then another 20 miles is going to be 46 miles. 46 miles in a night. And then when they were done with that that night, 
what they decided to do was to sneak attack the troops. So they probably came along here. The troops are along here attacking Gibeon. They sneak along the backside here would be the most reasonable thing, right? And it says that it pursues them. This would be Beth Haran right here. So the Lord threw them into confusion who defeated them at a great slaughter in Gibeon and pursued them along the ascent to Beth Haran and struck them down as far as Ezekiah and Maqueda. Right? So that is, they pursued them that night. Let's see how far this is going to be. Because assuming that they, we're going to assume that they had, they got them right here at where Beth Haran is, is historically located. And we go on a straight line from here to the places where this battle is historically located. That is 15 miles of fighting after marching 46 miles and fighting. That's a lot, y'all. That is, that is a lot. The adrenaline alone would probably wear you out just from the march, right? If you had the ability... Like, I'm not saying it's impossible because people can do some pretty am amazing things, but a 20-mile journey for a man is all right. A 20-mile journey for a group is hard. A 40-mile journey for a group of fighting men is possible. Absolutely. We train for it. But it's hard. And at the end of that, to fight a heated battle in which you rout the enemy and then chase them for another 15 miles through terrain. Right? You're not walking down the road. You are pursuing an enemy through terrain. That means that they are going to at least try to delay you in some manner, hopefully for them, and you have to evade said attacks. And it's a slow progress, right? Another 15 miles of progress against an an enemy even in retreat is that's that's impressive that is a hell of a feat because you're talking about about 60 miles overall travel at double time or at least at time and a half that's that's an impressive feat not even to say it didn't happen but that's impressive but here's the thing in order to get down here they had to pass through this city, right? This city right here, it lies in the middle of that. And tactically speaking, you can evade the city, that is true. But why would these people who had got routed right here not immediately fall back, either to Jarmoth here or over here at Gezer? Why does that not happen? Instead, they bypass the city where there's probably at least some fortification and at least some defensive maneuvers in place. But the Lord throws them into confusion before Israel, and they defeat them in a great slaughter along the ascent. So they're confused because they got ambushed, right? And they fled before Israel along the descent. And the Lord cast down on them large hailstones from the sky, and more of them were killed by the hailstones than by the swords of the Israelites. Now that may tell us part of the reason why. We won't know for sure. There's no way to look back and observe this battle and to know exactly what happened. But these hailstones might make a difference. And here we venture into conspiracy land. Because I'm going to talk about something completely irrelevant to this particular study in context. So, I'm of the opinion, and I can't state it for a fact, but I'm of the opinion that there is a cycle of events that take place. <clears throat> this cycle of events is tracked fairly well. It happens on a fairly regular schedule. It's about 12,000 years, and there are smaller cycles that are inside of that that are broken down. There's a 6,000 year half cycle. There's a 3,000 year quarterly cycle. The timing of this event falls out pretty close to 3,000 years ago. If you know where we are, in the particular cycle that I'm talking about, you know that that is significant because 3,000 years from then would be now, and that would put us at the 12,000 year mark for the big cycle. And so, if you're unfamiliar with that cycle, I suggest you check out Ben Davidson over at Suspicious Observers. 
he does a much better job than I can do breaking all of that down. And so, this is the conspiracy part, and this has got nothing to do with Ben. <clears throat> it, well, I mean, not directly. Like, there are plasma events that happen to us, and they are significant to us in various ways. There is a historical reference to indicate that the Earth has turned 90 degrees several times throughout our history, and then it is triggered by cosmic events. And in between those cosmic events, smaller events happen, and this was one of the smaller events. And what happened here at this event is recorded across the globe in different cultures at around the same time. It's very hard to date exactly, but it's about the same time and it's recorded as the same event as the Earth standing still. And a best guess estimate from what I have been able to research is that the Earth passed through a plasma trail-ish type thing. Now, some people speculate that that trail came from a planet and it is called Nibiru, and that it's on a pattern that repeats and returns to us. I used to hold that thought more than I do, but I don't dismiss anything. Now it seems more like the universe is like a neural network in your brain. and There's a whole lot of trails that go off into different directions and they conduct energy from one place to another. The reason that our star glows is because it is receiving energy and then dispersing that energy to us through these trails. Our magnetics on the earth play into all of that. <clears throat> and so this particular day in history, I believe that we pass through one of these corridors through one of these trails that exist in space that are independent of us but that are definitely arrayed in a pattern because everything in life is arrayed in a pattern and so it is not unlikely in my mind that we pass through one of these trails in our course through space and that it had an effect upon the globe now whether or not that was directly attributed to, to Yeshua and the Israelites is completely irrelevant because other people recorded this. This was recorded in the Far East over by the Asian scholars over there, and it was recorded in the South Americans. So it's not influence. It is a separate recording of the same type of event. <clears throat> What I believe happened is this is also the time that we went from a 360-day year to a 365-day year. And then the actual time of our globe changed a little bit. And we, we slowed down and the day got where it takes more of them to go around. That's probably happened before and it will probably happen again. There is no one on the planet who can tell you when, but there are signs to look for, and those are described in this book. All of that is saying that I do not believe that this next part is impossible, or that the hailstones were impossible. I do, however, believe in the opportunism of humans and the fact that the victors write the history. And the fact that this happened is, to me, not in dispute. Whether or not it was influenced by people, yes. Or by God saving anyone. It could very well be that the commander of the Lord's armies that we saw in the previous one that we don't ever really see again could have timed this, right? And on the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Yeshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel. O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance upon its enemies. Is this not written in the book of Yeshar? So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down, about a full day. The book of Yeshar, Jasher, however you want to pronounce it, is not one of the canonical books. We do not have a reliable Book of Yashar. Oh, that does not mean that you shouldn't look at the available ones and see what is there. 
There is no day like it before or since when the Lord listened to the voice of man, because the Lord fought for Israel. And then Yeshua returned with all of Israel to the camp at Gilgal. All right. And there has been no day like it before or since when the word of the Lord listened to the voice of a man. And here we have a problem. Here we run into a consistency error because the infallible, inerrant word has just contradicted itself because what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah when Abram pleaded, what if we find a hundred men? What if we find ten? The Lord listened to the voice of a man. He did not turn from his judgment. On that particular case we'll get to that but in that particular case he listened to the voice of a man and he reasoned with the voice of a man there's been no day like it before or since when the Lord listened to the voice of a man all right well how about when Moses in the midst of a rebellion from some of the Levites asked the Lord to swallow them by the earth there has been no day like it before or since when the Lord listened to the voice of man. Now you can reason that this has to do with this next part where it's because the Lord fought for Israel, but was the Lord not fighting for Israel in that case when he opened up and destroyed the dissenters in the face of Israel? Was that not fighting for, for Israel? And maybe, maybe not. Maybe you can reason that. I don't. This is, there are so many instances, right? How about when Moses was at the Red Sea and he asked God for deliverance and the waters parted and then the, the, the whole army of Pharaoh was destroyed in its pursuit. Was, was that the Lord listening to the voice of a man? I think I hammered the nail. And then Yeshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. <clears throat> Now, the five kings had fled and hidden in a cave at Makeda, and Yeshua was informed the five kings have been found and they are hiding in the cave at Makeda. So Yeshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and post men there to guard them. But you do not stop there. Pursue your enemies and attack them from behind. Do not let them reach their cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. And so Yeshua and the Israelites continued to inflict a terrible slaughter until they had finished them off. So Yeshua and the Israelites continued to inflict a terrible slaughter until they had finished them off. And the remaining survivors retreated to the fortified cities. The whole army returned safely to Yeshua in the camp at Makeda. And no one dared utter a word against the Israelites. Then Yeshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. And so they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. And then when they had brought the kings to Yeshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had accompanied him, Come here and put your feet on the neck of these kings. And so the commanders came forward and they put their feet on their necks. Do not be afraid or discouraged, Yeshua said. Be strong and courageous. For the Lord will do this to all the enemies you fight. And after this, Yeshua struck down and killed the kings, and he hung their bodies on five trees, and left them there until evening. And at sunset, Yeshua ordered that they be taken down from the trees and thrown in the cave to which they, in which they had hidden. And then large stones were placed against the mouth of the cave, and the stones are there to this day. And on that day, Yeshua captured Makeda and put it to the sword. Along with his king, he devoted to destruction everyone in the city, leaving no survivors. He did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the kings of Jericho. And this set of verses right here are part of the apologetics that have to deal with Jesus. Because these this actions right here, and because Joshua put them into the cave and sealed the cave is the reason why Jesus was put into the cave and the cave was sealed. 
an end to many things were meant to come from Jesus' death. Many, many, many things. An end to curses that lasted almost like a millennia, like at least a millennia. So, yeah. And the conquest of the southern cities. So, where are we at right now? We have Jarmuth, we have Azica, and we have Makeda, uh, Eglon, and Lakish. Did we have Azica and Makeda? Yeah, we went back up to Makeda. All right, so we're about to get into the rest of the conquest here. <laughs> and then Yeshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. All right, let's look at Libna. Where's that one at? That one's up here, right? No, no. Oh, I think I might have labeled this one. No, that can't be it. Where is Libna? I know I marked it. Maybe I maybe I didn't. It's a southern kingdom. Oh. Anyway. Well, that's ill prepared, Jeremy. <laughs> Moved from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna, and the Lord also delivered that city and its king to Israel. And Yahshua put to the, all the people to the sword, leaving no survivors. And he did to the king of Libna, as he had done to the king of Jericho. And Yeshua and all of Israel moved with him from Libna to Lachish. Alright, so this is Lachish. Libna, I believe, is in the middle here somewhere. Uh, there, is, there is some that place it on the coast over here, but... That doesn't really make sense in the path of conquest as much as the placement over here. Right? He left from Makeda. He went and conquered here. And then he goes down into Lachish to, to firm that up. So that's how that happened. I did. I looked it up. I thought I had a pen. And he put all the people to the sword just as he had done to Libna. At Lachish. At that time, Horam, king of Gezer, went to help Lachish, but Yeshua struck him down along with his people, leaving no survivors. So let's look at Gezer. Gezer was up here, right? And so he was coming down, probably about where this road is, and the scouts at Maqueda let him know, and they come up behind him, and they ambush them, and do what Israel does. So Yeshua moved from Leklish to Eglon and all Israel with him. They laid siege to it and fought against it. And that day they captured Eglon and put it to the sword. And Yeshua devoted to destruction everyone in the city just as he had done to Lachish. And then Yeshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron and fought against it. And they captured it and put it to the sword as king, all its villages and all the people. Yeshua left no survivors just as he had done at Eglon. He devoted to destruction Hebron and everyone in it. Let's look at Hebron. Hebron, as y'all know if you've been studying long, is one of the <clears throat> one of the major cities that I believe that were one of the, the original cities. I believe it is one of the power sources for the planet. I believe that it is one of the focuses of our grid lines. And so it is important to note that although they control from Jericho, over past I, into Beth Haran, all the way down over to here. They don't take Jerusalem first, although that would be how I would probably do it. They take Hebron. Now, the argument can be made either way, but holding here with a small force and then taking a force into Jerusalem this way, if the pass is allowed, like I said, I'm not an expert on the, the exact topography of the area. Seems to would be the way that I would do it, but Hebron was more important. Hebron is where the spies went when they turned around because the people were too large and the produce was huge. They had to carry the grapes on a stick between two men and the people made them look like grasshoppers in their sight. Like they were looking at 30 foot tall people. That's where this area is. So it does make sense to want to take that area out first. And they captured it and put to the sword its kings, its villages, and all his people. And then finally, Yeshua and all of Israel with him turned towards Debir and fought against it. And they captured Debir, its king, and its villages. 
and they put them to the sword and devoted to destruction everyone in the city, leaving no survivors again. Yeshua did to Debir and its kings as he had done to Hebron and as he had done to Libna and its king. So from here all the way over to here and then all the way up to here. Well, they haven't taken the actual city and the surroundings of Gezer yet, but they destroyed its army. So over up to here, Beth Haran. This whole section, with the exception of Jerusalem, they haven't actually taken Jerusalem. They killed its king, but they have not taken the city yet. And so Yeshua conquered the whole region, the hill country, the Negev, the foothills, and the slopes, together with all of their kings, leaving no survivors. He devoted to destruction everything that breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. He conquered the area from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza, and the whole region of Goshen, as far as Gibeon. And because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel, Joshua captured all of these kings in their land in one campaign. And Joshua returned with all of Israel to the camp at Gilgal, which is another point of power, I guess. Maybe I missed where he went and actually took the city of Jerusalem. Did he actually go back and take Jerusalem? I didn't think he'd actually done that yet, but maybe he did. Okay, so he yes, this whole area with all of these blue outlines here belong to him with the possible exception of Gezer where it's not clear, but Goshen is here. Now this can be confusing because if you recall back in Exodus, the Israelites lived in the land of Goshen way over here. This was Goshen. But now there is also a Goshen here, and this is where it is traditionally located. And they're talking about Kadesh Barnea is attributed as one of the stations when they were leaving Egypt. Now we talked about how I believe that they came up this route, but I'm not even going to argue it right now. It could have been a stop on this route just as easily as it was a stop on this route. However, they came up here and they were defeated right here at one point and they retreated and went around. So they took over this land all the way up to here with the exception of this particular area, which is currently still in dispute. I'm trying not to mention it as more than absolutely necessary for algorithm purposes. But it is important to note that that area remained independent. So, Yeshua conquered the whole region, the hill country, and then gave the fit holes and the slopes. Uh, captured all of these kings in their land in one campaign and then returned with all of Israel to camp at Gilgal. Now, again, let's talk about <clears throat> what it means when it's talking about the cities, right? Let's take Jarmuth right here in particular, just because it's convenient. You would probably have the city proper here, but outside of that, it would probably control a good deal of this area around it. Defined by topography and other local people, such as Maqueda over here, right? So when they go in and they take control of this city and they devote to the sword all of the inhabitants, they are also doing the same thing in the wilderness to the greatness of their capacity. They are going out to the individual homesteads and flocks and doing the same thing there that they are doing in the cities. And so the only way that you could possibly take control of the entirety of this area and then return with the entirety of your forces to this area is if there is no one left behind. Now we know that there are people left behind over here. It is reasonable to assume that when it says all of Israel, that there were some people left behind as a reserve force, that the forces become somewhat depleted and the need to return to Gilgal is to resupply, rearm, and reinforce. The conquest of the northern cities. This one goes rather quick, so we're going to go through it too, but when 
Now when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard about these things, he sent word to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the kings of Shemron and Ashaph. All right, let's look at those. Now we are dealing with the top side. So Hazor, Shemron, Madon. Uh, the other one mentioned is close enough in here that it does not need its own designation. But this is the area well north, right? They have conquered up, supposedly and believably, up to Mount Ebal. They control the entirety of the land east of the Jordan up to the Sea of Galilee and quite a bit beyond it, almost to Damascus. So they have just destroyed the entirety of this area and taken control of all of this in a single campaign returned here and are resupplying. It is a reasonable assumption that the kings who lived up here would be like, this is probably bad for us. And this is Sidon up here. Right? This is probably bad for us. We should probably do something about this. And that is exactly what is happening here. Right? So they send out word from them. Right? Those kings send word out to the kings in the north, in the mountains, in the Arabah, south of the Chinnereth, in the foothills, and in Naphtador, to the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Pezzarites, Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites at the foot of Mount Hermon in the land of Mizpah. Now, I did not go through and mark all of these, except for Mizpah, because that comes in again in a little bit. Uh, but it is this entire region saying, hey, we have to come together because if we don't, we are about to receive exactly what happened. There can be some interesting correlations taken from the European nations in the 30s with what is going on here. Karma is a thing. And so, these kings came out with all their armies a multitude as numerous as the sand on the seashore, along with a great number of horses and chariots. All these kings joined forces and encamped at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. That's one I should have looked up. And then the Lord said to Yeshua, Do not be afraid of them, for by this time tomorrow I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You were to hamstring their horses and burn up their chariots. And so, by the waters of Merom, Yeshua and his whole army came upon them suddenly and attacked them. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of Israel, who struck them down and pursued them all the way to greater Sidon and Mesrephoth Mayim, and eastward as far as the valley of Mizpah. They struck them down, leaving no survivors. Yeshua treated them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burn up their chariots. <laughs> and so, by the waters of Maram, I should have looked that up, so let's see if we can figure that out, but it has got to be on this side of the Sea of Galilee. It has got to be somewhere between where these are controlled and where Israel controls. So it is reasonable to assume that it is in this area here that they met and did battle. I'm not going to try to uh, pull up Google and Google all of that, but it may be right here, right? This looks like it's water. It looks like it may be man-made. It may not. Maybe this is it. But it is reasonable to assume that it is going to be in this area between these forces and these forces. And it includes all of the forces from Sidon to Mespa. Now, when it talks about where it chases them too. They route them down here and then chase them all the way up here. But how do they achieve their victory? Is it valiantly in the field of battle? Do they array themselves to meet in valorous combat? No. Not, no, no, not, not again. Once again, Yeshua is being a sneaky snake. And what he does is, he catches them camping. 
and he takes his forces in and he goes in and he he injures their horses and burns their chariots now I understand the rules of conquest I am even okay with conquest I don't expect them to to adhere to the morality that we have today but the morality that we have today was given to us by God and could have been given to them by God as well it is perfectly acceptable to injure the 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 tools of war in any means necessary when you are in a war when you are fighting for your survival you can use whatever you need to to get it done but I mean that's a hell of a step right instead of coming upon the whole army and sneaking them in the manner of Israel's past instead what we do is we go and we kill the horses because these are men trained in the, the use of chariot combat and if they don't have their heavy horse that's a significant change in the combat tactics I, I'm familiar with combat tactics I don't get into that a whole lot here but I know the difference between between cavalry and infantry and so they're taking out their cavalry they're taking out their their tanks they're knocking from the field of battle the heavy hitters and that absolutely makes sense setting their chariots on fire absolutely makes sense I'm not saying that it doesn't my problem with this whole thing besides the fact that they are conquesting right we don't hold with conquest these days the, the problem is the level of destruction that is given. You can justify some bloodlines. I did it myself. You can justify the bloodlines of the Anakim needing to be expunged. The fallen ones, the Nephilim being erased. You can justify that. But not all of these people are that. And a lot of these people are put to the sword simply because you want their land. Because you covet your neighbor's land and his livestock that is why you do this it was not on a command from God it was on a command from a man who said it was a command from God and at that time Yeshua turned back and captured Hazor and put his king to the sword because Hazor was formerly the head of all these kingdoms and then Israel Israelites put everyone in Hazor to the sword devoting them to destruction Nothing that breathed remained, and Yeshua burned down Hazor itself. Yeshua captured all these kings in their cities and put them to the sword, and he devoted them to destruction, as Moses the Lord's servant had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities on their mounds except Hazor, which Yeshua burned. And the Israelites took for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but they put all the people to the sword until they had utterly, completely destroyed them not sparing anyone who breathed. As the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Yeshua, and this is what Yeshua did, leaving nothing undone that all, of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. There's one thing that we know about Moses, is that he was pretty cowardly. <laughs> and so he didn't want to do this himself, so he shook it off on someone else. And then Yeshua took this entire region, this hill country, all the Negev, all the land of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, the mountains of Israel, and their foothills, foothills. From Mount Halak, which rises towards Sair, as far as Baal-God, in the valley of Lebanon, at the foot of Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Yeshua waged war against all of these kings for a long period of time. No city made peace with the Israelites except the Hivites living in Gibeon. All others were taken in battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to engage Israel in battle, so that they would be set apart for destruction and would receive no mercy, being annihilated as the Lord had commanded Moses. And at that time Yeshua proceeded to eliminate the Anakim from the hill country of Hebron, Debir, Debir and Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah and Israel, Yeshua devoted them to destruction along with their cities. No Anakim were left in the land of the Israelites. Only in Gaza, Goth, and Ashdod did any survive. So 
Yeshua took the entire land in keeping with all that the Lord had commanded Moses, and Yeshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to the alignments of their tribes. And then the land had a rest from war. So, we're about to get into a listing of this, but let's look from these blue dots all the way down to this blue dot, with the exception of three cities along here has been devoted to the destruction. We did a reasonable estimate when we started of 28 million. It is not unreasonable to assume that. According to the numbers we are given now, <clears throat> it could be 200,000 total. It could be more, like it could be 50 million. It could be 200 million. I don't know. I have to make a reasonable estimate as to the number of unalivings, and that appears to be a reasonable estimate of 28 million. I did not make a blue dot for every single place that has been event happened. Most of them I did. Most of the major ones are now indicated here, and this is the area devoted to destruction by Yeshua, son of Nun as directed by Moses, as directed by the God of Israel. That's an awful lot of sacrifice. This next part is going to be a little bit boring because we are going to be a quick recap of what happened and then I'm going to wrap it up after this. So Now there are, these are the kings of the land whom the Israelites struck down and whose lands they took beyond the Jordan to the east from the Arnon Valley to Mount Hermon including all the Arabah eastward. Now, we had already taken the Arabah eastward, right? That is the, the land to the east of the Jordan. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon. He ruled from Aor to the rim of the Arnon Valley, along the middle of the valley up the Jabbok River, on the border of the Ammonites, that is, half of Gilead, as well as the Arabah west of the Sea of Chinnereth, to the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, eastward, through Beth Jishamoth and southward through the below the slopes of Pisgah. And Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Rephaim, who lived in Ashtaroth and Edurai. He ruled over Mount Hermon, Salakai, and all of Bashan, up to the borders of the Geshurites and Machathites, and half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the Israelites had struck them down and given their land as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. The kings defeated west of the Jordan. And these are the kings in the land that Joshua and the Israelites conquered beyond the Jordan to the west, from Baal God in the valley of Lebanon to Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, according to the alignments of the tribe of Israel. Yeshua gave them as an inheritance the hill country, the foothills, the Arabah, the slopes, the wilderness, and the Negev, the lands of the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, which is near Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Debir, one. The king of Gedir, one. The king of Horma, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adalum, one. The king of Makeda, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tapua, one. The king of Hefer, one. The king of Hefek, one. The king of Madan, one. The king of Azor, one. The king of Shemron Merun, one. The king of Askfath, one. The king of Tanakh, one. The king of Megiddo, one. The king of Kadesh, one. The king of Jachnion in Caramel, one. The king of Dor in Naphtador, one. The king of Goyim in Gigal, one. And the king of the Tisra, one. And so, there were 31 kings in all. 31 kings. 31 kings. The conquest of Yeshua 
destroyed the entirety of the land, 31 kings, and a reasonable estimate of 28 million people. And this is how peace was brought upon the land. Because they were not already in peace. But they were. They were already in peace, despite the fact that the Anakim and the Nephilim lived among them. Now, that is not to say that the practices that they practiced were correct and that their sacrifices were correct in any manner, that their doctrines were, were good or right or just or true. I don't even know what all of them were. I, mean, I don't cast the moral judgment of that. They were living in relative peace to each other prior to an invasion of the land, as demonstrated by the fact that several alliances sprang up in the face of immediate danger. And yet, it was the will of God that they be that they go forth and that they drive out 28 million people. It was the will of God Almighty Himself that they go forth and drive out all these people. So much so that He stopped time. For the duration of another day. So that they could pursue and destroy these people. But he couldn't do it in the manner that he had promised them. He promised them no war. He promised them that these people would flee in terror before them. That was the promise of the Lord God Almighty to Moses, Aaron, and all of Israel that they would not be fighting that they would go and simply occupy a land and houses that they had never built that they would eat from vineyards and fields that they had never planted that was the promise and that God would drive them out slowly before them that was the plan. Not two campaigns of total conquest wading through blood. Like, you can say what you want about the heat of battle and the men under arms, but it takes a very cold-hearted individual to go out into the wilderness and take out the shepherds. And that is what has to have happened for you to wind up with all the flocks. It takes a cold-hearted person to go in a group under arms into a house where a woman and a child are waiting for their husband, who you took care of outside, to come home and are not expecting you with your group of men to do whatever it is that you do. But it ain't good and it ends in nothing, right? It ends in people being like, I'm not even going to attribute the violence that likely happened. I'm not even going to attribute that, but that's probably what happened because that is what happens. There's a lot of people out here today that think they want a war. They think they want to wade through combat. And I promise you, with all that is in my soul, that you don't. You do not want what happened here to happen but I'm going to tell you another thing that you're not going to like to hear it is promised to you what is promised and what many people have assumed upon themselves is that vengeance will be given for these acts yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about yet, but as we go forward through this study the rest of the way, it's going to become clear to you that God told, like, the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the very last book in the Bible, tells you that they will get vengeance for this. It will be given to trample. The power to victory will be there for a short time. And it's going to be a very rough time to live. And you don't want to be there for it. But we will probably. I will probably not die before we see these times. I might, I'm not setting a date. But the signs are all there. And we will get into that. 
the vengeance will come for this and it's not just for them these people will get vengeance wherever they happen to be for the aggressions that are being put upon them from wherever it happens to come from and there is very well a justification in this particular region of the area right and we can scope out to the bigger brown spot against the country that I am currently residing in. That doesn't mean that what's going to happen is exactly as it has been described. And we'll get into all of that as we go along. And I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. It is important to point out the things that I'm pointing out here. This was not just God gave them a land. This was a, they went and conquered the land. And I'm not going to take away from conquest because conquest is the history of history. Every land has been conquered and every land will probably be conquered again. You can only hold on as long as you can. And as long as you can remain moral and just to the best of your ability as a society. Only then will your ways be blessed. And that is pretty accurate throughout history. And that's where we're going to wrap this one up. Hopefully I didn't bring too much confusion. And hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment to a very complicated, very disturbing topic. I understand that I step on toes because I hold unconventional beliefs. And I am just trying to cast the shade where the shade should be cast, right? I'm not trying to be shade. I'm trying to be a light. And the light casts shade. This whole sequence of events is shady as hell and it needs some light cast on it that is all i'm trying to do to the crew thanks for hanging out i appreciate every single minute that you are here with me and i am praying for you every single day until next time i love you god loves you you are perfect whole and complete just the way that you are and this has been pit state peace